Uh, first of all, thanks, Fred. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to celebrate uh, Feynman's legacy. And this little clip you saw is interesting because, uh, in fact, we are trying to start the, to make the elements of a quantum computer using atoms. And this is only one possible implementation, but it's, uh, it's the one that uh, myself and my colleagues are working on. So I think probably uh, many of you in the audience <laughs> know what this uh, cartoon is about, but for those that, that, you, that you don't, I'll try to, to explain a little bit what Schrodinger had in mind. Um, so I, I, as a kid, I always liked mechanics, and this is a picture of me and my friends in high school working on cars. Uh, to my mother's chagrin, at one point I had five cars, and you might say, well, this was a bit of a waste of time, but I did learn a lot about mechanics, and I also worked, uh, learned a lot about working in a team, which is very much like how research works these days. Um, so I, I would always like math, and so when I got into college, I I uh, got interested in quantum mechanics. And so I'm going to try to explain a couple of the strange features of qu quantum mechanics that would come into play in this, in this quantum computer. And, and one is the idea of superposition. In this picture here, you see this box. And uh, if, you, if you look at it, certain times you can see uh, one of the faces being in the foreground, and another time you can see another face being in the foreground. So if I... If I uh, if I expand this out here, you, you can tend to see one orientation of this box. But the, but the key part is, if put back together, is that th this image here, it has both properties at once. And this is, a, I think, a good analog to this, this idea of, of quantum superposition, that somehow we can make an entity that has both properties at the same time. So. Uh, and another thing that uh, this particular example I like is that it, it, in, in quantum mechanics, we can, it turns out we can make these superpositions, at least on a small scale, but when we actually observe them, they tend to go into one uh, situation or the other. In, this, in the example of the box, we, when we measure it, it goes into to one orientation or the other. So uh, another, another example, which kind of emphasizes that you saw this pictorial example, but something we can do in the lab is we, uh, in our, our atoms, we, we say we store them in a trap, but you can, and a good analogy is like a, having a marble in a bowl. And the marble can roll back and forth, so at one instant of time it will be, say, on the left side of the bowl, and then a, later on the right side of the bowl. And, but can we somehow make a situation where it's both on the, left side of the bowl and the right side of the bowl at the same time? And the answer is yes. Now, these pieces of our marble, they'll roll back and forth, but the key idea is that certain instances of time, the, the, the marble can be both on the left side of the bowl and the right side of the bowl at the same time. Now, this makes no sense in our ordinary day experience, but this is the, the kind of situation we play with. So another one that's uh, 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 maybe more interesting to, to realize these ideas of a quantum computer is on the right-hand side here. We know quantum mechanics taught, taught us that, uh, for example, electrons that, that uh, surround a nucleus, so if we have a single outer electron, it, it will go into certain discrete energy states. And for example, we could call the lowest energy state, we could call that a zero, and we could uh, excite the atom to some higher energy state, and we could call that a one. Uh, so we can, in fact, make memories out of single atoms just the way the, the binary memory works in your, your PCs and, and laptops. Uh, but we can also make these superposition states. So in some sense, the, we can make states where the atom is both a zero and a one at the same time. And this is, this is where the one of the ways the power of a quantum computer might come into play. For example, the, uh, both Krista and John mentioned the, the factoring algorithm. And one of the features of the factoring algorithm is that we, if we can make all of the bits that carry the number we're trying to factor, we can plug that into our quantum computer and it can work on all those numbers simultaneously because of being able to make these superposition states. So, 
uh, coming, back, coming back to, to Schrodinger's cat, uh, one of the, Schrodinger being, of course, one of the inventors of quantum mechanics, he and people like Einstein, the other founding fathers of, of, of quantum mechanics, they would sit around and think about the consequences of, of, uh, uh, of the, the ideas of quantum mechanics, and one was superposition. And the thing, one thing that bothered uh, uh, Schrodinger was that, well, in principle, this, this newfound theory of quantum mechanics, it should scale to very large situations. And so uh, uh, Schrodinger, to express his discomfort with the theory, he cooked up this example of Schrodinger's cat. So the idea is we have a box, and inside this box, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put an apparatus, uh, first of all, consisting of a, of a radioactive particle. And if the particle, uh, and we're also going to we'll have an efficient detector to, to detect whether the particle decays. And his example was we'll have some mechanism such that if the, if the particle decay, and we'll put a cat inside the box, uh, that's the key. Uh, and if the, the, the idea of this, this uh, box then is that if the particle decays, uh, it'll trigger some mechanism that, that releases poison and kills the cat. So not a very nice example if, you, if you're cat friendly, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, that, that, was, that was his way of explaining the, uh, you know, his discomfort with the ideas as far as the quantum mechanical uh, equations that we know about. In principle, it would be hard to write down the equations that describe the situation, but the key, the key thing is that in principle we could and so what, what, the, what this example of Schrodinger's cat says that if you believe in quantum mechanics, then after a time which is equal to the time where the, the radioactive particle has a 50% chance of decaying, that the only thing quantum mechanics tells us is that, uh, that the situation inside the box is the cat is neither dead or alive, it's both dead and alive. And we call this a entangled superposition, this, this, uh, John mentioned the idea of entanglement, and this is a, a simple example where uh, the entanglement in, in this case means that the state of the system, the cat in this case, is correlated with whether the, the radioactive partic uh, particle has de decayed or not. And these, and these, these entangled superpositions, which a co uh, quantum computer relies on, it, 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 it uses these kind of states where you have the amb ambiguity of w what, the, what state the system is in. So anyway, Sch uh, Schrodinger, as I say, I, I'm always amazed because being an inventor of quantum mechanics, he's had these misgivings and it bothered him throughout his career. And so when, even in the, in the 50s, which was the latter, the latter part of his career, he was still bothered by this. And this was at a time when we couldn't do these simple so-called thought experiments in the lab. And he, so he, in, in one of his papers, he said, well, maybe, maybe these, in trying to understand quantum mechanics, we've cooked up these, these thought experiments that should happen on the single atom level. But he said, well, he said, well, in fact, at that time, we, you know, we couldn't play with single atoms or molecules, and so what he was saying here is that maybe we're leading ourselves astray. That's the reason we don't see Schrodinger's cats is that this, these ideas are somehow wrong, and they hadn't been proven even for very small systems like atoms. Well, in fact, these days, we, this is kind of the world we play in, and this is a picture we, in our lab uh, at, uh, at uh, NIST in Colorado. We started these kind of experiments in the in the mid-70s. This is one of my colleagues, that Jim Berkowitz on the left there, that we spent our whole careers, have spent our whole careers together working on these kind of problems. And in fact, we, we didn't know about all these exceptions or worries that Schrodinger had. We thought, well, why, why don't we try this? And so, uh, in fact, we, 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 we were able to, have been able to develop some of these simple ideas of quantum computer uh, in our lab, we, we, we work both, uh, apply some of these ideas to atomic clocks and, and also now quantum computers. I certainly want to say that we're, we're just one lab. Just the work, the, the, the number of labs that are just working on atoms as possible uh, realization of quantum computer, there's almost 40 groups around the world. And then there's also 
many other possible implementations. So it's a pretty big enterprise by now. So what do we need? We need to make these superposition states. We need to work with individual quantum systems, in our case, atoms. And we need to apply the control. Now, there's a lot that goes into this, which I can't uh, <laughs> explain in this short amount of time, but give you an eye, some idea what we do. We have a, uh, what you see in this picture, there's an electrode structure, these blue rods, and we apply, in our case, we use charged atoms, atomic ions, and we apply electric fields to these, these, uh, these rods, <coughs> pardon me, to, and we can hold, grab onto the charge and hold the, 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 the charged atoms in one place. So in the middle of the picture there, you see these, there's some uh, yellow-orange blobs there. They're, in this case, meant to represent two atoms. So those are our atomic ions. And it turns out we can manipulate the properties with, the, uh, with laser beams of these systems. And so uh, in this case, just to remind you what were the our atomic ions, we're going to think about these the, uh, the, the atoms being in two different energy states, which we can uh, then make uh, label as our, our, the, the uh, parts of our quantum bit. So again, there's a lot of details. I, I can't <laughs> convince you how we do this, but it turns out we can, we can use the, the forces, uh, the electromagnetic forces from laser beams. We need to use that in combination with the Coulomb repulsion between the ions, and we're able to, to make these elemental logic gates. And so on the lower left of the picture there, you see a, a truth table uh, which shows how we can make a, a, a logic gate between two bits. And the, the first entry on the, on the left side of that diagram, or, the, or the, the left side of the each grouping of two, that's, we call it a control bit. And you can see if you just follow through that truth table, if the control bit is a, a zero, nothing happens to the second bit. If it's a one, it flips the state of the, of the, of the second bit. And this, this we can make uh, logic gates in our classical computers this, uh, the, uh, that do this, but the key part of this is it works on superposition. So in the lower right, uh, the little example I wrote down there is if the, if the first bit is in a superposition state, uh, if you follow the truth table, you get a, a situation in the lower right-hand part where it's a superposition of both bits being in the zero state and the, and the one state at the same time. And this, this is very elementary, but the, the, the idea is that it turns out with these very simple primitives, this uh, a logic gate like this, we can, in principle, do uh, any arbitrary computation that we might want to do. So this was, uh, as, as has been mentioned, one of Feynman's great contribution was to think about some of these basic ideas. And not only that, but uh, he, he had the idea that maybe we can, these logic gates that, that we can make, it turns out that they can simulate physical interactions. For example, the, uh, these, this gate that I just described to you, it can, among other things, simulate the interaction of two electrons in a solid. And uh, so if we can build this system up to many quantum bits using our ions, we could simulate these complicated many body problems in solids, for example. And that, that's just one example of the kind of problem we can hope to solve. Uh, let, me, let me conclude by saying I mentioned that we, in our lab, we also play with atomic clocks. And if I do this right, I should be able to to, to teach you all how an atomic clock works, at least the basics. And that is the simple idea is that we can take a particular case, and one would be, say, where an electron is oscillating around a nucleus. And uh, it turns out these are very regular oscillations, and we can, it's very much like a pendulum clock. And we have way, we've developed ways to measure these oscillations. One of the interesting things these days, uh, our clocks are, are such that we can measure very high frequencies. In fact, frequencies that are synchronous with laser oscillation. So I, in the upper right-hand corner, I show you uh, some measurements we've done on mercury ions where the oscillation of the electron it, it happens at about a million billion times a second. Uh, and we, we have ways to measure those oscillations and therefore make a make a, a clock. And one of the just one of the little side interesting things since with these ideas of 
quantum computing logic gates have come along is we, we can make certain entangled superposition states where the, uh, where we, where the atom appears to be oscillating. If we have n atoms, the, 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 the clock we can make appears to be oscillating 10 times faster than the clock we would have with one atom. And the reason this is important, by having higher and higher oscillation frequencies, we can define the, uh, any, any given unit of time into much finer divisions by the, the increased number of cycles. So this is, just, this is just one example of the things we hope to do. And I, 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 you, in Krista's talk, you talk she, she told us about some of the future applications. I think uh, most, many of us are optimistic about this idea of simulation that that Feynman th uh, thought of. This idea of factoring useful numbers for cryptography, that's, that's what got the field going about 20 years ago, but it's probably far the hardest problem anybody's thought of. But I think the real, the, the real hope we have is that maybe, maybe it won't happen in the next decade, but I think that's the right time scale where we can think of really useful simulations for the, some of the things that, that Krista talked about. So with that, I'll conclude, and thanks very much. <laughs>